Continuing our introduction to theology series, we now turn to Christian traditions and a crash course on Protestant sub-traditions in this episode. In the changing global religious landscape of 2015, Pew Research have Christianity as the largest religion, making up almost a third of the Earth's 7 billion population. Then in the anniversary of the 500 years of Reformation in 2017, Pew Research presented one of the five facts about Protestants around the world is that they make up a total of 36.7% of Christians all around the world, second only to Catholics, which is at 50.1%, but larger than the Orthodox, which is at 11.9%. Catholic was originally Greek. It simply means universal, but it became a technical term for Roman Catholic Church. Orthodox is also Greek, but a combination of orthos and doxa. Together, they literally mean right opinion, right teachings, but it also became a technical name for the Eastern Orthodox Church. However, Protestants also claim both adjectives because of their generic meanings. Protestants also claim to be the universal church. Protestants also claim to have the correct teachings. Anyway, these three are what is known today as the three major Christian traditions in the world. But how did they come about? Isn't Christian unity a very important matter to the Lord who prayed in John 17.3 that they may be one as we are one? The apostles even wrote in Ephesians 4 verse 25, We are all members of one body. And they warned against destroying this body through factionalism, saying, If anyone destroys God's temple, God will destroy that person. In 1 Corinthians 17.3 So how did this happen? It is true, in the first 1,000 years, the church was essentially one even though there were five centers, namely Jerusalem, Antioch, Rome, Alexandria, and Constantinople. The early teachers in the church valued and emphasized Christian unity. For example, Ignatius' advice against schisms or against schismatics is to always follow the bishops, the presbytery, and the deacons in order to preserve unity by not doing things without their approval or supervision. For them, the highest authority in the church is the bishop, and the rest of the hierarchy involves the elders, or the presbytery, and the deacons. By the way, schism is the term they use to describe breakaway groups that broke away from the one true church. In the Roman Catholic canon law, a schismatic is a baptized person who, though continuing to call himself a Christian, refuses submission to the Pope. Even the Russian Orthodox Church has this to say. Due to the violation of the commandment of unity, which has led to the historical tragedy of schism, divided Christians, instead of being an example of unity in love and in the image of the Most Holy Trinity, have become a source of scandal. Christian division has become an open and bleeding wound on the body of Christ. The tragedy of division has become a serious visible distortion of Christian universality, an obstacle in the way of her witness to Christ before the world. For the reality of this witness of the Church of Christ depends to a considerable degree on her ability to live up to the truths preached by her in the life and practice of Christian communities. And so schism was really a big deal, and their solution was submission and obedience to the hierarchy. So let's find out how each tradition sees the history of church schism. Let's start with the Orthodox Church. According to the Orthodox Church, it was the Roman Patriarch who pulled away from the other four by pursuing his long-developing claim of universal headship of the church. Oo nga naman, if there is one universal headship instead of five ecumenical centers, then there will really be an assurance of unity, di ba? So, antalino nga ng Rome. But according to the Orthodox Church, the other minor issues why Rome 
broke away from their communion is her addition of the filioque clause to the Nicene Creed. Sabi nila, nag-cos yun ng lamat, but actually it was the pursuit of the Roman Catholic Church to universal headship in 1054 AD ang cause ng pag-break away ng Roman Catholic Church. So yung Roman Catholic Church ang nag-break away. And then Protestants broke away from the Roman Catholic Church in 1517. On the other hand, according to the Roman Catholic Church, it was the Eastern Patriarch Potius who began schism as early as 880. It was just fully consummated by another Patriarch, Chirolarius, in 1054 that the Byzantine Church been formally out of communion with the Roman Catholic Church. So sa version ng Roman Catholic Church, yung Orthodox Church ang nag-break away as early as 880 AD. Formality na lang daw yung 1054. Now what about the Protestant Church? How does the Roman Catholic Church seize their schism? Rome blames Luther and his followers and their quote-unquote erroneous views and quote-unquote rebellion against ecclesiastical authority. And eventually led him to open apostasy and schisms. So what do we learn from this? So for the Orthodox Church, tradition is important. They are therefore more conservative than the Roman Catholic Church, who as it turns out, are in the process of developing their own theology on papal authority. So madaling salita, Orthodox Church is conservative in nature and refuse any further theological development. They didn't want anyone adding to the Nicene Creed. They didn't want anyone to disrupt the ecumenical and the autonomy of the patriarchal centers. And true enough, they remain theologically unchanged throughout the years. However, for the Roman Catholic Church, authority is most important. They are quite fine when it comes to theological developments as long as the Pope has the supreme authority and the magisterium has the final say. And this made it impossible to preserve their unity with the East. Of course, there are other contributing factors aside from politics, like the difference in language, Greek versus Latin, and later on the invasion of the Turks, and then later on the Crusades. Now, according to the Roman Catholic Church, Luther and his followers were guilty of quote-unquote false doctrine of justification by faith alone. Of course, ultimately, it boils down to the question of authority. Luther and his followers did not submit to the claims of infallibility of the Pope to determine the doctrine of the Church because they were already seen to have corrupted the Gospel. So Luther turned to the authority of the scriptures instead. And this is what he said in the 1521 under trial. Unless I am convinced by the testimony from scripture or by evident reason, for I confide neither in the Pope nor in a council alone, since it is certain they have often erred and contradicted themselves, I am held fast by the scripture adduced by me, and my conscience is held captive by God's word, and I neither can nor will revoke anything, seeing it is not safe or right to act against conscience. God help me. Amen. So now let us see how the Protestant Church sees the church history of schisms. These are just three theological problems with the Orthodox Church that goes against the gospel according to the Protestant Church. Number one, The Orthodox Church believes that man, after the fall, still possesses free will. Number two, sacraments put man in touch with Christ. God accepts his children in baptism, fills them with the Holy Spirit at chrismation, and then sends Jesus to live in their hearts through communion. Number three, salvation and redemption means deification. Itong tatlong to are just some of the examples of indication of the corruption of the gospel according to the Protestant Church. Now let's see how the Protestant Church views the Roman Catholic Church doctrines. Three, magbigay tayong three examples. Tradition is at par or even beyond the authority of God's word. Number two, 
penance is necessary for salvation, especially for those who have fallen after baptism. Baptism infuses justifying grace. And number three, they say they don't worship Mary and the saints, but they bow and pray to them. These are just examples or indications of the corruption of the gospel in the Roman Catholic Church. For the reformers, the authority rests on those who are faithful to proclaim the gospel, hindi doon sa nagpipreach ng corrupted gospel. So ito yung sabi ni Martin Luther noong 1519 during the debate in Leipzig. So the topic was about justification and Eck provoked Luther to digress to the matter of authority and this is what Luther said. A simple layman armed with scripture is to be believed above a pope or a council without it. Neither the church nor the pope can establish articles of faith. This must come from scripture. For the sake of scripture, we should reject pope and councils. That debate was a turning point for Luther because he just finally, with a clear conscience, renounced the blasphemous Rome. So this is how, kung sa orthodoxy, ang importante sa kanila ay conservatism, at sa Roman Catholic Church naman ay authority, para kay Luther at kay Calvin, sabi nila, Christianity stands or falls upon the doctrine of justification. Sabi ni Martin Luther. Sabi naman ni John Calvin, justification is the hinge upon which true Christianity stands. Kaya lang, by their defiance, they have just democratized theology. The authoritarian Rome was also called Cesaro Papism, and they have had a habit of burning schismatics and heretics since 1076. John Hughes was already burned alive in Constance, Germany, and because then there was no separation of church and state. The church back then had civil and police power, and they just burned John Hughes for renouncing the authority of the Pope. The difference with Luther is that he had the protection of the Holy Roman Empire, which was Germany, and the Reformation was already spreading across Europe. So now let's turn to the different sub-traditions within the Protestant Church or within Protestantism. What you see on your screen is one way of looking at it through their soteriology. Those with Calvinistic heritage and those with Armenian background, and then the later movements that came from both camps. We'll talk more about this in Soteriology. Another way of looking at the Protestant sub-traditions is from Life Magazine, 1947, is through their four sub-branches. Lutheranism in Germany, Anglicanism in England, Calvinism in Switzerland, and others, or what they call the radical sects, also called the left wing, or the stepchildren of the Reformation. The democratization of theology triggered by the Reformation brought them out into the open. Not that they were not there before. Actually, they have been brewing against Roman tyranny since 1400s. There have been nonconformists even before the Protestant Reformation. But let us use the version of the Economist of 2017 in our discussion of their sub-tradition, starting with the period before the Reformation. The Lollards were followers of John Wycliffe, to be known later as the Morning Star of the Reformation. He completed translation of the Latin Vulgate to English Bible in 1384, of course with the help from assistants. And they were against pilgrimage and saints' worship, celibacy, and they also denied transubstantiation, and they also rejected baptism and confessions as necessary for salvation. They were denounced heretics by Rome, and those who do not renounce Lollardy were executed in the 1500s. Next, the Hussites. They were followers of John Hughes of Bohemia, now in Sec Republic. He was influenced by Wycliffe, and he also spoke against indulgence. The Hussites were condemned heretics, hence they were also persecuted and even beheaded. Hughes himself was burned at the stakes in 1415, now the European Reformation. Like Hughes before him, Luther criticized indulgence. 
He nailed 95 theses on the door of All Saints Church in Wittenberg in 1517, and then he was tried in the Diet of Worms, and he was excommunicated by Pope Leo X in 1521. Elsewhere in Switzerland, Reformation was also taking shape through the initial efforts of Swingley. In what is to be known later as the Affair of the Sausages, a pastor who spoke in favor of eating sausages during the Lent was supported by Swingley on the basis of Luther's Sola Scriptura, therefore advocating liberty to fast or not to fast because the Bible makes no such prohibitions. Swingley had a lot of agreements with Luther except one, the Eucharist. For Luther, the bread and wine in the Lord's Supper became truly flesh and blood, whereas Swingley regarded them merely symbolic. After Swingley's death, though, the efforts of Henrik Bullinger and John Calvin, they adopted the Confessio Helvetica and the Canons of Dort, which would become the theological foundations of Calvinist Reformation. So far, the Reformation was pretty much in the union of church and state, just like the Roman Catholics were. And this was called Sacral Society. Verdin defines it as a society held together by a religion to which all the members of that society are committed. However, there were those who do not adhere to this concept. Instead, they view the church as only an element in the larger society and not coextensive with the whole society, something that we now enjoy what we call the separation of church and state. Such were the Anabaptists, which is Greek for rebaptizers. And this brings us to the next point of contention with the reformers as rebaptizers. For the Anabaptists, the only valid form of baptism is when the candidates confess their faith in Christ. Hence, they were called credo-baptists which also goes in conflict with the reformers who were not yet weaned from pedobaptism or baptism of infants. By the way, the Baptists are not direct descendants of the Anabaptists like the Mennonites and the Amish. Ito yung mga direct descendants nila. And not only that, they were also pacifists. And so because of these things, the reformers joined the Roman Catholic Church in persecuting the Anabaptists. The direct descendants of Swiss Reformation is the Presbyterianism founded by John Knox. He was influenced by Calvin when he met him in Geneva and he created a new order of service which was also adopted in the Reformed Church in Scotland. Presbyterianism is a form of church government of multiplicity of elders or council of elders. This is in contrast with Cesaro Papacy, or what we call monarchical bishops, which is a one-man rule. They have a book of order that regulates their worship and practice. On the other hand, direct descendants of Lutheranism is Pietism, but only within the Lutheran tradition. And then Anglicanism is the term for Reformation in England. Their direct descendants are the Episcopalians, which is what it's called in other countries like the United States. Through a royal decree in 1534 known as the Act of Supremacy, King Henry VIII broke away from the Roman Catholic Church and declared himself supreme head of the Church of England. But it was under his successor, King Edward VI, that England really went through English Reformation, which came to be known as Anglicanism. Puritanism came about in England out of their dissatisfaction in the slow pace of reformation in the Church of England. Also reformed in theology, hence they had an alliance with the Church of Scotland and they became a political force in England. The direct descendants of Puritanism were the Separatists, Baptists, Quakers, and Congregationalists. The Baptists came out of reformation because they rejected pedobaptism. And therefore, like the Anabaptists, they were also rebaptizers or credo-baptists. And they practiced baptism by full immersion of head and body in the water. Quaker, also known as Religious Society of France, they were experientialists, or those who emphasized direct religious experience of Christ. They were opposed to the creeds and hierarchical structures, 
Hence, they also came out of the Reformation. Congregationalists, on the other hand, remained reformed in theology but became more democratic in their church government than the Presbyterians. This means that every local church for them is autonomous and every members of a local church have the right to make decisions for the church. Meanwhile, religious tolerance is gaining momentum in 17th century United States, and those who faced persecution from Europe went to what was then a colony of England. Like I said earlier, the early reformers still did not abandon the idea of sacral society. Catholics persecuted Protestants, Protestants persecuted Catholics, Protestants and Catholics persecuted dissenters and nonconformists. It was truly a scandal. And so the colonies in North America became safe haven for separatists who wanted to worship God according to the liberty of their conscience like what Luther said. Many of these nonconformists, like the pilgrims who immigrated in 1620. However, even Puritans immigrated to North America in 1630. Unfortunately, they brought their intolerance with them to North America and persecuted the nonconformists there. But when the American independence was won over the British in 1783, the United States forever enshrined to its constitution in the First Amendment the free exercise of religion adopted in 1791. Finally, here is a would-be powerful nation which aligned itself with the boldest innovation of the New Testament, the separation of church and state. Verdin has this to say, this is one of the New Testament's boldest innovations, the sweep of which will not escape the thoughtful. In this novel view, it is plainly implied that there are resources in the as yet not regenerated human heart due to the remnants of the original righteousness left after the fall, resources that are adequate for the affairs of state, loyalties that are adequate for the political level, over and above the loyalties that result of the New Testaments, render unto Caesar the things that are Caesar's, and unto God the things that are God's. He also said, in the New Testament vision, that which we today call the state, and that which we now call the church, are agencies that cater to differentiable loyalties. The state demands a loyalty that all men can give, irrespective of their religious orientation, and the church demands a loyalty which only he can give who believes in the Christ. The state has a sword with which it constrains men, coerces them if need be. The church has a sword also, but it is the sword of the word of God, a sword that goes no further than moral suasion. So the conflict arises only kapag yung state oversteps its boundary, or the church, or when the church oversteps its boundary. As they perform their own separate duties, then there will be peace between the two agencies. And we cannot understate the importance of this tradition brought to us by the reformers as well as the radical ones. We thank God for them that we are enjoying the benefits of their labor. Now we look at what is called the Great Awakenings, or the religious revival that happened between 1730s and 1740s. This movement involved preachers like Jonathan Edwards, George Whitfield. Their preaching all over the place renewed dedication to religion and spawned the Moravians in Saxony, the Methodists in 1730, the Southern Baptists in 1845, and the Seventh-day Adventists in 1863, Salvation Army in 1865, and the many holiness churches in the 19th century. Holiness movement of Methodism is another experiential Christianity which emphasizes personal religious experience that paved the way for the modern evangelical movement, starting with Pentecostalism, Assemblies of God, and the other churches in Brazil, Nigeria, and the many charismatic movements in the United States and all over the world. In fact, according to Pew Research, the Future of World Religions, Population Growth Projection 2010 to 2050, while there are 2.3 billion Christians around the world, 9 out of 10 countries with the largest Christian population are no longer in Europe. Brazil and Nigeria 
and even the Philippines will still be in top 10 even in their projection for year 2060. And in the 2017 Pew Research, they also found that Pentecostalism has gained ground globally in Sub-Saharan Africa, Latin America, and even in Asia, as you can see. In a survey conducted in 2014, the majority of the church-going Protestants across 19 Latin American countries said they have at least occasionally witnessed speaking in tongues, prophesying, and praying for a miraculous healing in the church.